Welcome back, Fight Fans. It is another edition of the MMA Huddle uh, coming off International Fight Week, which was historic. It was crazy in parts. Um, it was damn right disgusting in some of the fights that you, you had to view. It was absolutely horrendous to watch. But as per usual, there's always a lot of talking, uh, a lot of stories that come out from it, the week at International Fight Week. And um, always, always good. I shut the bed bet wise. I lost myself a considerable amount of money. But I have been due that considering the first six months have been really, really rock solid. So. Um, and we had some future fights kind of being made with Brock Lesnar making his return, which I, hand and heart, did not have any clue that that would even happen. And we were just talking beforehand about the promo of all promos. Uh, it was a little bit cringy, but it absolutely nailed the um, the participation of probably the, the people buying the pay-per-views coming forward in the, uh, next year it'll probably be. So how did you enjoy fight week? Um, we're moving on to the boys Idaho. Did you enjoy your weekend of fights? Mate, I always enjoy fights. Always, brother. Um, I think the biggest highlight for me was the face-off. The biggest face-off of the year for the biggest fight of this year coming up, which is Tito versus Mr. Chuck Liddell. I think that, yeah. I think that kind of was the highlight for everyone's weekend, wasn't that, it? That was weird. The UFC are going to put that fight together. I think the UFC are going to put that fight. I don't think it's... I, it was just weird to me that they did it in front of all the press at a UFC event. Well... I think they're going to do... I think they're going to crow promotion with Golden Boy, whatever the hell they are, and I wouldn't that surprise me. It was weird. It was weird, because then you had yeah. Triple Triple G rock up as well, the I, media. That was, was a, that was a really weird... Because you got Dosca De La Hoya, triple, it's a really weird... And then you got, so you got WWE, boxing, UFC, and they're all kind of kind of mingling together. It's a, it's a weird concoction, man. Weird. It's, I keep, I keep hearing about this Zufa boxing. Yes. So I wonder. I wonder if they're starting to like do like partnerships and stuff like that, and maybe um, just cross promoting. Yeah. And, you and scratch so, my back, I scratch yours. Yeah, and it, to do with it, that. It was like it was a weird week all week from the the Holloway the pulling out, and then uh, obviously there was some new tough coaches announced for later in the year, which is another fight we're going to get to see, which is going to be a good fight. Might be the last ever tough. Yeah. I think, fingers honestly, crossed. I think it's, I think it's it's past its sell by date now. Even I'm oh, a, I'm a top fan. Ago. Years ago. Um, I think it's time to kind of rein it in, and it's quite cool that they've got two former champions of tough that are going to be, but maybe the last ones in there, and they're going to have themselves a great fight as well. And one under champion, so mm. uh, yeah, we're going to say that was last week. Um, we're moving on to this week. Big thank you before we start uh, looking at the fights as to the. We now have over 200 subscribers looking at uh, YouTube at 206. Um, so thank you to the the new people that have um, subscribed. And uh, let us know who you are. Come and say hello. Drop a, drop a comment um, if you've been listening in. Uh, we appreciate the support. We're going to try and we'll maybe speak um, the next week or two, maybe getting a number to try and hit the end of the year, maybe 300. I don't, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities. Another five months or so. If I, we can get anywhere near 300, I think it would be fairly decent. So, um, But we'll take what comes. We're moving on to Boys Idaho. Like I said, we've got the return of Junior Dos Santos in the main event. A guy I've always been a fan of with a newcomer coming to the UFC. That is not really a newcomer because we we know who the guy is. But as always, we're going to start at the bottom of the card. And we're going to start in the, the women's strawweight division with a fight that was originally meant to take place. Uh, what I mean, 225 in Chicago, I think it was, where the uh, Jess Gargalar against uh, Jody Escabel and Jess Gargalar had to put up with chap lips. It was the New York card, actually. It, it was, was the commission, yeah. It was the commission, not <laughs> UFC Utica. That was it. Yeah. So Jess Gargalar got pulled because she had chap lips. So New York Commission just doing fantastic there. So uh, Jess Gargalar against Jody Escabel. You can you can take us off with this one. Okay, bro. Yeah, I'll uh, resonate with what you just said before about the subscribers. Thanks very much, folks. Keep keep coming. Keep joining. We're here for you guys, and we love the sport. So let's go uh, with this fight. Man, like you said, it was meant to happen. Shocking, shocking commission with the dry chap lips. Um, man, this is a tough fight because you've got Jessica, who's she's a vet of the sport. She's Isn't she the Invicta FC matchmaker or one of the Invicta FC matchmakers off the top of my head, I believe, as well? Combat, Erica, or something. I don't know. I don't know. It's yeah, yeah. So yeah. She, she's, you know, smart fighter, intelligent fighter. Jody Escabel, uh, 
she came into to, to, to the UFC as well. A bit of a, bit of a uh, momentum behind, like a bit of a, a bit of um, expe expe expectations. I, I think the pair of them, you know, haven't delivered on both sides. I think they're both kind of uh, not kind of being thrown on all cylinders. For me, in this fight though, I'm probably going to favour Jody. Now, it's not a lot in this fight, honestly. When you look at the, when I looked at the footage, one thing I saw with Jessica Aguilar is that whenever she like, especially if she gets you down, she's not she's good on top. She got, if she gets on top, but the thing is, if you can scramble, if you can fight and be do and be tough on the from the bottom, whether it be breaking the gap between you and her, and what I mean by that is, if I get on top position, I want my chest on you to keep it tight. If you can get your elbows, knees, push away, just be awkward, get her to guard and push her away. She has a really tough time at getting through and getting back in. It's when she gets the initial takedown and getting you down, she's good there. I think if Jody can keep it there and just be awkward for her, on the feet, I think Jody has the bet just a slightly better striking. Um, not jo j j yeah, I'm gonna go Jody on the decision because um, Jessica has got good chin on her. She can take she can take a punch in the face. Don't get me wrong, that girl's tough. Uh, I, I, but I just feel that Jody's got a little bit more in her arsenal. I think she's got a little bit more output, and I think that sadly for Jessica, it's it's a li it's come a little bit too late in her career getting into the UFC. I think it's just one of them ones where I think I believe she's thirty six now. It does have an effect, especially in these low weight classes. You're not going to be forty and, and this fat and fast at that in that weight class because these, these kids, these people are fast at that weight class. So decision for Jody. Mm. So I'm not going to change my uh, pick. I, I was heavy on Jodie last time. I actually had a bet on her before the fight got pulled and she was a big underdog. Well, a fairly sized underdog. And um, looking at this match coming up, I think the, the odds makers are going to be smart and they're going to they'll put her as the favourite, actually. And So that money's probably probably gone. Uh, I lost old. She's, she's good, but she's nothing stands out. If she can't get takedowns, then I don't think she wins the fight. I think that Escabel throws a lot more output. Um, she's just quicker, and I, I just think it, the different kind of times of their career. I think Jody actually will be more hungry to actually get this win there. So I'm going to stick with my original decision of uh, Jody Escabel to win via decision. Flyweight division with Mark De La Rosa against Elias Garcia. Um, Elias Garcia is a cousin of the Pettis brothers. And I've been shooting myself in the, the foot since last night regarding not betting Anthony Pettis, talking him up last week and talking him up through the week and <laughs> hearing people talk absolute shenanigans about him being done and him not being the fighter he once was. And he might be... He, last night he looked more of the fighter he once was in a long time, which was really uh, good for me to see because, like I say, he is... I think along with Diego Sanchez is probably my favourite fight in the UFC and he has been for the longest time. Um, but this was the guy that was on the looking for a fighter show and Dana went down to, I think it was um, Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, Mexico, yeah. This guy knocked out Adam Antolin who's a, a fairly decent veteran. He was on the Ultimate Fighter and he knocked him dead. And that's not, yeah. I don't even think he's a strong point either. I think he's... Um, and he's against Mark De La Rosa here, who is um, he's got a smoking hot wife who fought on Friday night, by the way, and won on Friday night. Um, mm -hmm. Had a really tough introduction to the UFC. I think he fought Bantamweight against... It might, I think it was Bantamweight against Tim Elliott. And Tim Elliott's just a rough match for anybody in your first UFC fight. Um, got manhandled, got submitted. Um, the quirkiness of Tim Elliott just showed in that fight and the experience. And here he's got himself a better matchup matchup I'm looking forward to see I'm looking forward to seeing Garcia because there's not I haven't managed to see as much as I wanted to see of him but like I say from what I've seen decent striking coming from Rufus Sport you're going to have that with the head coach who's uh, Duke, Duke Rufus um, and then you've got the ground game there he works with Daniel Vanderley who is one of the most kind of unsung guy out of Rufus Sport really really good and uh, very underestimated I'm kind of struggling with this match a little bit because I think De La Rosa's got a lot more experience. Garcia's um, coming from a really solid camp. He's, he's training with really solid people. That camp's really on the kind of rise as well. They've had Sergio Pettis win. I know Paul Felder lost, um, but Anthony Pettis won. Gerard Mearshart won. So there must be a really heavy um, sense of confidence in that camp at the minute. So I'm going to go with Elias Garcia, actually. I think... Um, 
I think it's going to be close. I can see this being a, a split decision, but if if um, it goes to the ground, I think Garcia could actually sub him as well. But the pick's going to be Elias Garcia via um, some uh, fear decision. Sorry, how do you see it? Man, it is a tough one. I'm with you on that 100 percent because what I watched uh, Garcia and De La Rosa. De La Rosa, like, like I say, Tim Elliott fought Tim. I know Tim Elliott fights at flyweight and he fights at he fought bantamweight. So it's not. It's really more case that bout was guy. Both guys are not cutting weight, but um, De La Rosa, you know, he did well. He did well in some parts of that fight against Tim Elliott because I would have thought he would. I thought he was going to go out first round if I'm honest with you. So he did well on his on his part. Um, but Elias has got some holes in his game. He has got holes in his game. He's only young. I think he's five. Is it five and zero? Oh he is or five and zero? Oh top of my head. He's only young. He's a young nipper. He's shown a couple of little holes in his game still. He's still developing, still growing. I see Elias Garcia just like I did when I saw Sergio come in. He's a bit green still. He's got a couple of things to sort out. And I figured a couple of... I think give Elias Garcia two years, I think he'll start to get his groove in. Now, I'm not saying that in these next two years he's going to get batted. I'm just saying he's not going to be winning every fight for the next two years. He's probably going to win some, lose some. I don't think he wins this one. I think Mark De La Rosa does get the win. I think he's just a little bit better, De La Rosa, um, with the bits that win you the fights, the important times to get the important things like the takedown or like the strikes, the certain strikes that can land, that can get you points. I think that Mark De La Rosa is a, a, a kind of tidier fighter, whereas Elias Garcia might go for the more fancier shots. As you know, cousin of the Pettis brothers, they like to do some of the, some, the kind of spinnier kicks or just the kind of showboat kicks, I'd say, or shots or punches. Just, just when I think sometimes basics get your wins. And I think if Elias Garcia keeps it basic, he, he might be okay. But I just feel that in this one, he's going to just come up a bit short. But it's not a bad thing to lose, especially this early on. Look at what Sergio Pettis is doing now. You, you know, he, he lost a couple of fights and it's, it benefited him more than anything else. So I'm going with De La Rosa uh, for a decision win because the fights that I saw of Elias Garcia, he, he can hold his own. He's a tough kid. He's a tough kid. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting matchup, actually. I'm really looking, I think yeah. De La Rosa is a very live fight. I think, like I said, I think it's going to be close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on, we have a, a, another newcomer at the UFC. We have Liz Cormish yeah. facing off against uh, Jennifer Maya, which actually I had no idea that she even... And sign with the UFC. I, I don't know how I managed to miss it. Ages one. ago, mate. It was a while Probably, back. I don't know how I managed to miss it then. Yeah. Uh, so I think she was a, an Invicta champion as well, wasn't she? Yes, yeah, she was, mate. Yeah, so yeah. Make, move across. So uh, lead us off here and tell us what you think. Yeah, like it was a while back. Jennifer Maya uh, signed up to the UFC, so um, I was a bit, you know, surprised. I think I think one of the, I think one fight maybe fell through. I think it was for her. That's why it's it takes so long, but. Um, if we look at Liz Carmouche first, I do you know what really gripes me. I see always bring up the Ronda Rousey fight. I know I'm doing it now, but I mean on commentary, I'm like, look, that was years ago. It meant nothing. Can we just get past it, please? Like, stop talking about it. Let's talk about Liz Carmouche now. She's a fighter who's like a one-on-one, -on -one, one -on one at bantamweight. She was just a little bit too short on some fighters. She came up okay, the goods, but there's certain girls in that weight class, kind of like Jessica or I where they were just a little bit too big, a little bit too strong, and she just couldn't get her way. She's now in a weight class that's more suitable for her, where she's got a bit more of a fairer chance. I still think she's, like, tiny. You know, I still look at her and think, God, she she could be like a uh, Jessica Andrade, and maybe, she, I wonder if she could make 115, you know? I wonder what, she would be an absolute monster at 115. But anyway, she's 125. Uh, I'm... I'm this fight, for me, I'm going Liz Carmouche. All Liz has to do is get that grappling in. Let's do the grappling game. Simple win here. Jennifer is going to want to strike with you. She's going to want to stand. She's got a kickboxing background. She'll want to stand in. She'll want to kick and, and punch. And that's what she wants all day long. But if Liz can just do the right thing, get her on top and get her down, just use those double legs, use that solid strength. Like, she is strong, Liz Carmouche. Low center of gravity. Just get her down. Just get... Liz needs a win. It's the best way to describe it. She just needs to get that win. Doesn't matter how you do it. Just get the get the three rounds under your belt. Uh, Jennifer's going to try and get the strike, and I feel that she might come undone a bit because when she's on the back, Jennifer, she's not. 
she's not the most dangerous with the submission threats she will go up for them but it's a bit telegraphed so if Liz is uh, a little bit smart all she has to do is get to half guard get a half guard pin that leg down that's between the legs and then she can just wear wear on um, Jennifer there so I'm going decision Liz Carmouche I know I'm picking a lot of decisions here I know at start but these kind of weight classes it tends to happen I've gone Liz decision mate yeah I'm kind of the same ilk actually I think that um I think it's a good fight actually for Maya to step into the UFC but I also think there's some disadvantages she's got here I think there's a strength disadvantage um that um Carmouche has and Carmouche really she only kind of loses to fairly decent fighters I mean the Alexis Davis loss last time out well I think um I actually thought Carmouche probably probably won that fight actually I, I thought it was really really close yeah Lost to Misha Tate, she lost to Alexis Davis in the past. But when she shows up, she's a really, really hard fighter to face. And I think she, if she pressures and doesn't get pressured, then she wins the fight. If she backs her up and doesn't back up herself, pretty much is what I'm trying to say, then she will go on to win the fight, in my opinion. She's too strong. She's pretty well rounded as, as can be. I think everything levels out with, with Maya a little bit. And she's got that big jump to the UFC. She's going to have the... the the, the nerves coming at the UFC uh, it happens with everybody um, and I just think that Carmel she's going to be stronger she's going to get takedowns I think that um, Maya can get off her back and it's got a fairly decent fairly decent get up game Not nothing special but, but she can I, I think she will get back to her feet but I think Liz Carmel she's just a little bit too too experienced too wily for her here and um, will we'll win the fight via a decision Moving on to the, the Fox Sports 1 corner, they kick off with a, a fairly fun fight in the featherweight division. We've cut Holliver against uh, Riano Barcelos. And I'm sure this is the first fight that Holliver's back since he got that ban, didn't he? It for is indeed, mate, yeah. For taking, for taking the IV. Um, and to be fair to him, uh, Holliver is a really kind of talented regional fighter, strong strong guy he won in that who did he beat on that was it Matt Bissett that he beat yes yeah it was mate yeah so he was who fought the weekend in a really fun fight with Stephen Peterson and he's a guy that just he won the Titan um, title I believe yeah. it was he beat uh, GZ Calvacante he beat Sedeno he used to be in the UFC so mm. fairly decent fight and he, he's only really lost to I think he, this is his second run in the UFC if I remember right yeah he was tough he's tough, tough as nails mate he's Stephen very hard Peter. guy yeah. Was like he lost two in a row, Pat Healy, Stephen Siler, all way back in 2013. Went out in the regional scene and did really, really well and got himself right back in here. And he's got another newcomer here in uh, Barcelos, who I think he's like 32 or 33, so he's got a bit yeah. of age to him. And a um, one record. Another guy that I thought would have actually gone to the UFC a little bit earlier than, than what he did. I was supposed to face Boston Salmon last year. It's a shame that that fight got pulled because I'm looking forward to seeing Boston Salmon again. Mm -hmm. um, but he's did all right. He went out on the the regionals in RFA and yeah. um, defended his title. Yeah. Knocked, out, knocked out a guy who's in the UFC in Damaret. And he, the guy's really, really pretty well-rounded. I, I just think that for me right now, I think this, uh, this is a bit of a tougher matchup for him. Um, but Barcelos, I think, is dangerous everywhere. So you have to, to kind of watch your P's and Q's with this guy. Striking-wise, I think he's got a lot of power in his hands. Some fairly decent movement. Um, precision, a little bit iffy. But um, but he can land. He can light you up if he, if he lands like loads of multiple shots. So you need to be careful and have your, your defence up. He's, he's wrestling. It's the thing that I think stands out to me. Uh, high level changes, like high, like really high level uh, grappling exchanges, and he seems to find a way to, to get to the ground, and he follows up with some really ground and good ground and pound as well. Can be a little bit sloppy, but um, I think he's a, a nice wee addition to the UFC featherweight division. I just think that Holbo. In fact, you know what? I'm going to go Rion of Barcelos actually. Actually, I don't know why. I'm just thinking this. See, I think it's going to be a close one. I think if he can get him to the ground, holdable, he might be able to unload some ground and pound. So I've changed my pick, literally. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go Rano Barcelos here to, to get a... I think he'll be an underdog as well. So I'm going to I'm going to pick him for the win here. Okay, I like it. Uh, bro, switch your camera off and switch back on. Skype has been a nightmare tonight, folks. Sorry about this. Absolute shocking. Absolute shocking, Skype. There you go. Um, your picture froze, that was all. But I didn't want to stop you in your flow. 
Uh, yeah, like you said there, RFA champ, and that's rep, you know, that Titan FC champ and an RFA champ, two legitimate belts to hold before you go into UFC. Uh, that's what I see both of them title guys as. Uh, so, to be honest with you, we've got a cracking fight. These two guys are good, solid level, like good, high quality level fighters. Man, it's because, well, Kurt was 155, I believe, went down to 145 for the UFC and stuff. So, dude's big and strong. Like, you know, like I say, he fought. 155 um, against like you say Pat Healy who he was just a monster of a guy man I'm like you it's so hard to call I'm going to go with Kurt see how you go I'm going to go with Kurt alright um, because he isn't as wild so to speak in some parts uh, like you say Barcelos can sometimes I think the only time but he, Barcelos is wild like you said before is when he's got the confidence flowing because he's he is in theory ahead on the card he feels good he's probably maybe a round or two up and he's just he's just going for it because he feels a bit safe and secure but the problem with that is it's a high risk then it's a high risk for a uh, low reward because in the UFC you're starting to get with guys who will take advantage of those small mistakes you can't make on the regional scene you could probably get away with one or two of those little mix uh, little mistakes and getting it carried away or messing around in the UFC it starts to come and bite you on the ass and so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna go with Kurt, but I do think Barcelos will, like I said, he's so live. It's a horrible one to call. Uh, I don't think there's much in it. I'm gonna go with random. I'm gonna go with uh, Kurt TKO on top of him. He's gonna be on top Barcelos. Bit of ground and pound TKOs in third round. All right, because I think he just wears him down by the third. Maybe I'm gonna go wild. Okay. Nice flyweight division with Justin Scoggins against Said. You might recognise this surname, Namagamedov. Um, I Who? think it's so, yeah, yeah. Who's that guy? Um, I think it's yourself to lead off with this one. Yeah, um, man. What a this fight is. Oh, man. Well, Justin Scoggins is fun, fun dude to watch. Like that, I, I can't ex like when I saw Scoggins against uh, Susaki. Oh my gosh, when that fight happened, I was so happy because they were both uber big guys for the featherweight uh, for, for the flyweight division. Long. And it turned out to be a really wild, fun fight. We've got the same again. Man, this is going to be a great fight. You know, it's Said's debut, uh, or Saeed, however you want to pronounce it. Um, he's, so it's, it's one of them ones, you know, he's a bit, he's stone cold killer kind of thing. Those Russians, they've got no emotions. Do they get such a thing as jitters? I don't know. I don't think they have a soul, so I don't think it counts for them. But, you know, he's going to go in there. He's very calm, you know. Said's so very calm in there, very relaxed. Justin Scoggins ain't like that, you know. So you've got a clash of styles, a very methodic, smooth, just calm pace and, and, and viper kind of striking inside against the kind of guy in, in Scoggins who's sporadic. He just throws his spinning stuff. He, he does the takedowns very well. You know, he mixes up really well. Man, and like I said, Scoggins went up, he did go up to bantamweight and he went back down flyweight. Man, it's a hard one. This is such a hard fight to call. I'm going to go with Scoggins. I, I'm finding it really hard to pick someone because I'm thinking Saeed could easily just take control here and get on top and dominate. I'm going to go wild. I think Scoggins has got that. Oh, no. No, I'm going to go Saeed. No, no. I'm going to go Saeed. Ah. Oh. I'm going to go say because, no, yeah, yeah I'm going to go say because he is, when he's on top, I think this is when Scoggins fails. When Scoggins is on bottom, that's when he makes the more mistakes. He's more vulnerable on the bottom. Anywhere else on the feet, on top, uh, on the feet, he's great. But when he's on the bottom, Scoggins, and he's past his guard, that's when he's a, not as dangerous. And I think say he can get there, past there, and cause problems. Uh, I'm going to go to decision only because both of them are absolutely crazy and wild and I love this fight so yeah yeah it's a good a really 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 good solid fight I'm, I've always been a not a fan of Justin Scoggins I'm an admirer of his I think he's got talent there but mm. I don't think I don't think mentally he's got what it takes to be a good fighter he makes so many mistakes that have lost him fights he was uh, winning the Sasaki fight yeah, wasn't he mate big time he puts his head in for submissions and you cannot do that with guys that you don't even have to be a good guy because he gives you them he leaves his yeah. doesn't tuck his chin in <sighs> right there you've got a choke straight away um 
like I say, I think I think he's maybe hit his he's he's kind of top with the UFC and like feeding him with these young guys coming in here to try and build the new guys off a guy a UFC veteran to say, but um, like Namagamedov is really different from his cousins like Khabib and um, his brother uh, Abu Bakar. That he's he's a lot different. He's not a grappler. Um, he's a striker. So it's weird that he's come from that fight but it doesn't mean that he hasn't got grappling or jiu-jitsu because he has he's got wins via guillotine armbar rear naked choke so um, he has skills on the ground there um, I think he's got a bit of a high ceiling I think with the UFC just for the fact that he's coming from that country and the people that he surrounds himself with are all fairly decent guys Makachev's and other guys around all the time winning fights and um no, he's, like I said, he's not the wrestler Garappa, um, but his stand-up is, is utterly superb. I think this is going to be a, a good back-and-forth fight with these two. Um, I think he needs to make it a grueling fight. I think he needs to push um, Scoggins back. He needs to he needs to be the one that takes authority, I think, in the fight. Uh, a very diverse kicking game. He needs to press him against the cage, but I think use that kicking game, push him back, uh, and keep him there, and that's when he can unload with front kicks, um, oblique kicks... Uh, high kicks, you name it, and he does spin on those kicks quite a bit as well. So, I think he's a really solid fighter. Um, keeps a constant pace. He's got a lot of volume. But the, the kind of the way I see this here is that, and another thing as well, he scrambles very well. If he does get taken down, he scrambles very, very well. That's one thing that I noticed. Uh, Scoggins is predominantly a striker. So it's going to be interesting to see the clash of styles here and see who's the more advanced striker. The one thing that is pushing me towards Namagamedov is the fact that Scoggins makes big, big, big mistakes. And all, I think all it will take is for one mistake and Namagamedov could could put himself in the driving seat in this fight and win it. Um, but who knows? I think it's a close fight. I, th I actually think that... Scoggins is going to make himself another mistake and he's going to put his head somewhere he shouldn't be and he's going to get submitted. So I'm going to pick Namagamero via early third round uh, submission there. Yeah, I, like I said, I love that matchup, bro, because he's, he's so calm at striking. It's crazy, yeah. though, isn't it? Like he's, just, he's almost like a heavyweight because he doesn't, he's just like calm, just plods towards, like, I'm going to kill you now. And it's. Yeah. Completely different. Throws you off, throws me off when I watch him. But yeah, mate, looking forward to it big time. Yeah. Moving back into the featherweight division again, this is a, a really good fight um, with a guy coming through the ranks against just the the hard nose, <laughs> the damage the guy with the, the, that tattoo. I say it every time. Um, Darren Elkins faces off against Alexander Volkanovsky in a, a really, really, really good fight here, and a fight that actually means something, and a fight that shouldn't be on the prelims of a, a Fox Sports One card. But in saying that. Considering how long these Fox Sports One cards take, I'm actually it's one of the fights I am looking forward to seeing. So I'm glad it's kind of earlier on in the night instead of late on in the night because Friday night's card past there was absolutely terrible. I went to bed with three fights left. I'm like, I'm done with this. I'll watch you in the morning. So, <laughs> um, yeah, what what can you say about Darren Elkins? The guy is just toughness personified. You need to literally lay the guy out if you're going to beat him. If you give him the slightest opportunity of uh, him taking the fight off you, he will do it. Mirsad Bektic did it. Michael Johnson did it. Um, Dennis Bermudez did it. So he's a guy that's on, I think it's a six, five, six fight win streak. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and his only loss was uh, Hakran Diaz, and then before that was Jeremy Stevens, and that was a long time ago. That was well over four years ago, four and a half years ago. So the guy's a good fighter that fights a lot. And he's now starting to fight those kind of top guys and guys that are coming through. Still don't think he gets the respect he deserves, if I'm being honest with you. I thought he might have got someone other than Volkanovski here, but when you look at Volkanovski, everything that he showed us in his UFC tenure has been really, really exciting. Um, not exciting to say the least, but just like he's a really solid, well-rounded guy. And he showed that in his wins over Hirota, young Jeremy Kennedy. I thought he absolutely just played with that guy last time out um, battered him there ragged very, off, very strong him. and Kennedy was unbeaten 11-0 and yeah. battered him there. It, was, uh, it was actually a really good fight to watch that one um, but it's just he's, he's a small I think he's going to be the smaller guy here 
against um, Elkins. But uh, if he lands takedowns, he predominantly wins fights, and that's what he's did in all his UFC fights. Um, I think he got three in the first fight against Kazuya, he got four against Arota. Um, I know he got three, at least four, maybe even five against Shane Young, and he did the same against um, Jeremy Kennedy as well. If this guy can establish takedowns and establish dominance, uh, he's going to win the fight. But then you've got a guy like Elkins, who is really, really rough, uh, tough to take down, I should say. Um, Bektic did get him down four times. Bermudez actually got him down. So he is susceptible to getting taken down. But what can you hold the guy there? And if you give the guy an opportunity, he's going to find a way to make the fight dirty and they can easily take the fight off you. Like, like I said, I like having bets on fight. There's no way I could have money in Alexander Volkanovski in this spot. Even though I think... Even though I think he's got a really solid chance to win here... I'm struggling to pick in this one because it's hard picking against Darren Elkins because he can make you look like an absolute bail end in the sp split second. Um, I am going to pick Volkanovski. Um, I have literally... It's like a 51-49 for me for Volkanovski because Elkins is so, so, so awkward to fight and it's just never out of the fight. So I'm going to pick Alexander Volkanovski to win via the... Uh, probably a split decision, actually. Mate. You are literally thinking what I am. It's horrible because you can't write off Elkins anymore. It's it, I'm sick of doing it. I'm sick of thinking. I go, nah, he's going to beat. He's going to stop. I'm not writing off Elkins. I'm going to pick Elkins. I'm going with Elkins. I'm doing it this time. I'm still going to go with Elkins. And one of the reasons is the dude striking. It's actually getting it's better. Yeah, yeah. He, like that team alpha male. They've figured out what his style is. And they found the right punches and the right kicks that suit him. They're not trying to make him like Chad Mendes. They're not trying to make him like Uriah Faber or Cody Gott. They're not trying to mould him into certain style of fighters. They've saw what his style is. And they've given him a couple of shots, a couple of punches, like uppercuts and inside leg kicks. They've given a couple of little things. And went, look, this is what you have This is for your style. These would suit you. And they drill it and they drill it and drill it. So I'm actually looking forward to seeing what he brings this time and what he drills this time. Um, and again, I think Volkanovski's going to have a bit of a tougher time getting Elkins down. Because um, I think Elkins, you know, like you say, he, he does get taken down, but he doesn't give it to you. He can make you work hard for it. And also Elkins, if he wants to, can get you down. And on the ground, well, Elkins is a bit of a ninja. Do you know, it's like, he will take it back. He'll sneak, jump for guillotine. Like, Elkins, legit, like honestly... I think Volkanovski is a horrible guy to have on top of you. Dude hits some fantastic ground and pound. He's so heavy on top. Gets you against the cage, smushes you in, and just literally lays hell upon you. Now, I can't write off Elkins because he's a walking zombie. and um, So I'm going to give the nod to Elkins. Uh, I'm going to go uh, some kind of choke submission. Hmm. Uh, in the third round, and probably in the last half a second of the round, of because it's because it's Elkins and he does he just does that stuff. So I'm going the final second of the final round with a flying triangle, Darren Elkins because he just somehow does that stuff. Jeez, uh, can you imagine if he does that? A flying what is that, a flying triangle or something? Like Paddy Pimlet. Jesus Christ. Uh, Right, bantamweight division with Eddie Wineland against Alejandro Perez. Fun fight as well, a, a, an intriguing fight. How do you see it going? Man, I, I forgot how many fights Perez had had. That dude has been around. That dude has had a lot of fights. Like Him and Eddie are pretty really well matched, actually. When I looked at it, I thought... I didn't. It threw me off. I thought. I thought. I knew Perez had a few fights, but I didn't realize it was over twenty. Like you know, he had. He's near near thirty now. And um, it is a good fight. But the thing is, um, Eddie Wineland is one of them guys who he's just shy of being the, the, in the top three, top four elite. But he's that guy who's just shy because he is legit good on the feet. I, I. He's weird. His style. It's totally weird. But this will Im this will invoke and bait Perez in. The style that Eddie has, Perez will be game to throw down. But Wineland throws... Wineland, to me, is like a Cub Swanson. Great combinations. Varies his strikes. Beautiful um, beautiful kind of combination striker. 
uh, I think Eddie just hits hard as well. Like Eddie hits hard. Dude doesn't wear wraps. He takes no wraps around knuckles. Bare knuckle style. Uh, and Perez though is one of them guys who he he he's got a good record on him. Don't get me wrong. But like I watch his fights and I'm like the dude's beatable. You know, there's times when I'm like, how's he not been beaten? Like how like when I watch it, I'm like, all you, all the fights I do was X Y Z, and I think the level of fighters maybe that's the problem. I like Perez, don't get me wrong, I think he's a good fighter. I just think Wyland's a better fighter. Uh, I know Ed Wyland's um, winding down his career, so to speak, excuse that pun, but he is. It's kind of, you know, like he's, he's, he's only probably got like a handful left maybe in his career. But I think Wyland gets this one done, I really do. And I think he puts Perez down and stops him. Uh, I'm going to go second round. I think first round, Wyland will start to get a feel for him, get the measure for him, start to t get that range. And when he gets that range and starts to starts landing them jabs for that range finder then he'll start teeing off with that uh, straight coming after with a straight straight uh, straight and a hook combo and i think uh, perez will be game to bite down and strike back but i just think he's a wyland's way too much of a cleaner striker mm. i'm gonna go the other way i'm gonna go perez i've went against perez one one too many times and <laughs> he, like, he um, just wins. <laughs> yeah he's one of those fighters that you um you like you beat this. My good friends Dan, like Dan Levin, best fight picks. Um, they always say there's weasels to this game, and they weasel and they win fights. And I'm just looking at my topology record here, picking picking Alejandro Perez, and I'm two and six. So I haven't got a good, I got a good read pick, picking this guy's fights. And I've I picked Lopez, picked Alcantara, picked Sukumtath, picked um, <laughs> before. So I've I've picked against them majority of the times, and. It, he, he's made me look an absolute fool. I think um, this fight's going to be close. I think, like you said, Wyland's, I think, a fight a, a little bit on the decline. I think he's he's open for getting hit. I don't think Perez can knock him out like he did uh, Matthew Lopez because I don't think Wyland will gas as bad. I don't think his chin will be in the air as much as what Lopez's was. But this guy just does enough to win for, uh, fights and rounds, and that's kind of where I'm going with this one. He uses low kicks really well. He pivots off uh, and throws a couple of combinations. Uh, he just he just does enough to win fights, uh, and I'm starting to come around to to him doing that because I, I haven't been for the last eight fights. So, um, Wyland's a guy that only fights once a year as well. So that's kind of thrown me off a little bit. Where Perez, he fought in April. He fought, I think it was uh, December. So he's he's fighting every three four months. He's 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 being really active in there. I just think he's going to win at least two of the three rounds of this fight and win 29-28 across the, the scorecards there. So that is the prelims out of the road. We're now on the main card and it's starting off in the women's bantamweight division uh, with an, intri an intriguing bout with Katz and Gano getting a relatively quick turnaround here against Marion Renault. Two kind of older ladies and was like 41, 42 years old and looks great for her age, don't get me wrong. Both of them look stupendous. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kat Zingano's coming off that loss to Caitlin Vera, who's probably next in line actually to face uh, Amanda Nunez if I, if I was picking fights. Yeah. She is coming off three losses. Rousey, Pena and Vera. I thought in that Vera fight she showed, I don't I don't think it should have been a split by any sense of the imagination. I thought that was a pretty clear win for Caitlin Vera was bigger, stronger, um, more technical with her takedowns where Kat has always been wild, comes in throwing punches, knees, you name it, to initiate the clinch to get takedowns. With Marion Renault, she's coming off that win over um, Sarah McMahon and I, I, there's not many fights that I absolutely nailed down to a tee, absolutely nailed that one and it's just because I've got a good read in Sarah McMahon. She starts quick, she fades and she, she gives you things. Um, Kat Zingano is not going to be that fighter that gives you things. She did get beat up in that Vera fight a little bit, but she kept coming and she tried till the, the very end of that fight. Um, I see this being a kind of a scrap, actually. I think it'll be a really interesting fight where Renault is the more technical striker, throws a nice job out there, where Kat will come just forward, barrel and punches to get in the clinch, land knees, and I think she can take Marion Renault down. What she has to be careful is that Renault is sneaky on the ground. She's and she's got a good top control as well. If she can get into that mount, like she did against I think it was Dudieva, 
Um, she absolutely destroyed her. I think that uh, Zingano is at a level of level or two above what Dudy Ava ever is. Um, and she's getting a quick turnaround here. I'm liking Kat Zingano. This to me is a 50-50 fight though. Um, either way, I can see it going either way. I'm just not, I don't know, I'm really, I'm kind of struggling with the pick. I'm going to go with Zingano. I've always actually been a fan of Zingano just for the fact that she's so emotional. Um, she she fights like with that kind of lion heart, comes forward, um, fights stupid sometimes. I must admit that her IQ is a little bit iffy. But I think she's going to want this win against Renault here. And as long as she doesn't get um, her back put in the ground and uh, Renault's on top dominating her, then I, I, I think she will win the fight and uh, she'll win via decision as well. It is a horrible kind of, again, this card has got a lot of 50-50 fights in. Trap fights, yeah. It's horrible. Like, I, I'm going cat as well. And the reason I'm going cat is because she's fighting regular now. Like, like look, Rousey. And after that, big gap. Mm. Juliana Pena, another gap. Like, that's not good. She's not, I know she lost albeit but the thing is she's getting the consistency of a being a fight camp b keeping her weight down getting that fight conditioning on point sharpness is going to be there a lot quicker rather than have to people don't understand that if you don't if you have a break between fights that that reaction time ain't there she's one she's out the fair enough she lost but she's back again i think she's going to have a better reaction time i think she's going to look a bit sharper she's going to be a bit more fluid and i think she's going to do a lot better this time around i think she's going to get decision win so I do think Renee was, too, Renee was tough. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I think she's fantastic uh, as, a, as a mixed martial artist. Very underrated in the UFC. Uh, I think the UFC don't appreciate her as well. You know, considering, like you say, she is 41 years old or something like that. The girl's kicking ass at 41, let's be honest, people. If that if that bantamweight that division has got a 41-year-old who's kicking ass, it says a lot that maybe the division isn't as deep as they thought it was. Or maybe just because... Renee is like a Randy Couture, just a genetic age, freak. Yeah. yeah, and looks great at that age, you know, and she probably does. Um, but yeah, I think Kat Zingano, she makes, she can be ugly in the fight, and that can really spoil Renee with that jab, like you said before. It, I think it spoils Renee's kind of style, what Kat does, and that puts you off. And, and like I said, Kat's wrestling is really good. Like, she's got really good wrestling. And uh, she can ragdoll girls. Um, I just think she doesn't set it up as well as she could do because she's so focused on the Muay Thai that she kind of forgets the, the gates of wrestling. And I think her blending of Muay Thai and wrestling are not to what they should be. And she should be a lot better. A lot better. Kat's wrestling, really good. Really, like, honestly, she's a high level. She should be able to blend it a lot better. But I think she'll get it done here. I think she'll get all three rounds. I think she'll look... Just a lot better. I think she'll have a little bit more than Renee each round. So on 30-27, Kat Zingano gets it in the bag. And uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be made up if she does, if I'm honest. Nice. Uh, moving on, Miles Jury um, awaits the return. And Chad Money Mendes, who has been out for a long time after getting caught by USADA for doing stuff. It was it was body lotion. It was body lotion. Yeah, that you shouldn't be doing. So, uh, yeah. Doping offences, that's what it was there, that's what it is. I don't see it, to be honest with you. A growth hormone. So yeah, the guy's nothing anyway. So yeah. He's about four foot tall, yeah. so he needs it. So his first fight in over two and a half years. It's a long time about in this sport, from from the level that guy was at, to to be coming back against someone like uh, Miles Jury. Um, I think it's yourself to take it off with this one, so I'll let you, I'll let you go. Like you just said there, mate, you took the words out of my mouth. I like the fact that they've given Chad Mendes this kind of fight because mm -hmm. he has been out a while. And it's st how often do we see the UFC give a guy who was, you know, in that top top three of the group, so to speak? And Chad was. He was top three. Easy. He was, he was right in that mix the whole time, always pushing for that title. And, and straight away, they throw, you guys, they throw these guys back in there at that level. And you're like, look, I'm not saying you give people tune-up fights or warm-up fights. But if you're realistic, the guys have dropped down the rankings. You should give them a fight that's applicable to where they should be in the rankings. If they're not fought for so long, their ranking drops. End of. You know, you shouldn't put them... 
you wouldn't exactly sh you shouldn't do um you should do Chad Mendes Brian Ortega do you know do you know that's in theory that's what they would normally do but they've done the right thing I think they give the Chad the right kind of fight um oh man like this fight Miles Drew is not bad don't get me wrong very good good very good fighter he's a good fighter obviously different styles they're different at different heights and uh, no one will ever see eye tie with Chad though but um I'm interested to see how Chad does because like he's done a lot of bow hunting. Have you noticed that? You've seen that yourself. Like, he does a lot of hunting, um, so you know. Obviously, he knew he had the break. He knew he had the ban. He knew he had time off. So he went off and enjoyed life. Fair enough. You know, kudos to you. So don't get me wrong. It's physically demanding. It keeps you in shape. But as you know yourself, the sport changes in six months. Not, not, not. Never mind two and a half years. The sport is not what it was two and a half years ago. Miles Jury, um, I think Miles Jury's going to have a tough time against Chad still. Because so I think Chad will just go back to basics, and the basics is the grappling. You know, just get Miles down, hold him down, pin him down, get your three rounds in your belt, under your belt, and get that winning, out you go. And that's all Chad has to do, just get himself back in the swing of things. Get The, the key for Chad here is getting those three rounds, getting that clock, getting those 15 minutes back. Chad won't get much out of this if he was to go in there and say start jury in 10 seconds. In fact, that will actually be detrimental to, to Chad. He needs to get in a nice free round fight. Um, I think you might. I think we want to see Miles is going to try and keep Chad at distance, try and keep with those you know straight punches. That's the best thing to do with Chad. Keep him away. Keep him lo keep it long. But I just don't think Chad Miles can do that. I think if Chad is still that good, if he's still that sharp, still that quick. I think he's going to get miles miles down. I think he'll keep miles down, uh, and he'll get those three rounds under the belt and get a 30-27 win. But um, I'm not writing miles off though to catch Chad out because I don't know how Chad's going to be. It's a hard one. Yeah, like I said, I'm looking forward to to Mendes returning. Actually, um, forgotten guy that division. The division's changed so much. When last time he was about, um, Conor McGregor was uh, he had the strap around his waist. Um, Josie Aldo had just been dethroned, I think, that same weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and since then, Aldo's kind of deteriorated. Well, not deteriorated a little bit, but he's he's moved down the pecking order. And there's new young blood at the top of that division, and there's young guys coming through that that have looked fantastic. So, um, yeah, looking at the the matchup, it's the ring rust for me that's a little bit scary about picking Chad Mendes because we know what he's got. He's got big power. Mm. and he has the wrestling skills there as well so with a guy like Miles Jury um, looking at what I am looking at right now is just like the differences because it's something I didn't look at earlier on was the, the height and the, the reach difference and so on but to be honest with you the two two and a half years that Chad Mendes has been out Miles Jury's only fought twice which is not a lot for a young guy in the sport um, a youngish guy, he's 30 years old coming on this year, but he's going to have a, a massive advantage with the reach but everybody will have that over Chad Mendes big height difference as well um, the thing that uh, I think people need to remember here is that Chad Mendes is coming off two knockouts as well and the last one was a brutal knockout but the thing is as well he's been out for two years so that chin's not been touched and it's been healing up and um, but once that the deterioration and the chin starts to show, it, it doesn't take much to put guys down. I don't think Miles Jury is the type of guy to do that. In all honesty, he's never been that type of guy to one one hit a quitter guy, uh, knock out people. I think Miles Jury is going to fight long. I think he's going to pop him from the outside. I think that Mendez is going to get very frustrated, um, probably with the 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 the, the length. And just the speed that Jury has, and the the well-rounded game that he's got. Personally, I would like to see Chad Mendes win because I think it'd be nice to see him back up in that top five, even though it's a completely different top five to what he was used to many years ago. Like I wouldn't even put would I put Aldo in the top five? Probably four or five. Um, with other guys like Ortega's came through the division in that time that he's been away. And, um, I think Miles Jury's just going to frustrate him here. Um. So, and he is crafty if, if Mendes wants to go for takedowns, he might catch a submission or so on. I'm going to go Miles Jury. I'm going to pick him via 29-28 decision. I can see Mendes 
potentially getting a round off, but I think that Rust's going to play play on him towards the end. I think that Jury will come through and win the fight um, there. So that is my pick for that one. They are moving on. We have Randy Brown against Nico Price. Another fight which um, kind of intrigues me a little bit because I've I think Randy Brown has talent, and I think he's got a, a game that's developing. Uh, and he's coming off that win over Mickey Gall, which is not set in the world alight, but it's a win on the light, the win on the when he's when he's faced these guys like Mickey Gall and Brian Camozzi, he's won those type of fights. I think that's the level he's at. Maybe a little bit above where they are right now. When you start going into your Bilal Muhammad's, even Michael Graves is a guy I I still rate fairly highly. He's not in the UFC, but he's a good good fighter. I think he can. He can easily win those type of fights. I think Nico Price is a hard guy to face though because he's a it's just that he's a weird well not a weird guy. He's just got a weird skill set. Herky jerky striking, kind of big, big uh, big stack lad as well. So if he gets you on the ground, he can he can dominate you from all kind of different type of positions. And he's a little bit batshit crazy as well. You never know what's gonna come with the guy. Uh, I'm never Never too sure what what we're going to see out of him because um, we've seen him in that Lucky fight where he really got dominated. The Joe Ban fight, he came out there and absolutely starched him. George Sullivan started slowly, looked a little bit ropey, but eventually got the the finish in the second round. I think that um, if Nico Price can land a shot and get the respect of Randy Brown earlier on, I think that Randy might make a mistake and he might get caught in a submission. So I'm going to go Nico Price actually to to catch a submission at some point in this fight and put him to sleep. So not overly confident, I'll be honest with you. But uh, I like him. I like Nico Price to win the fight here. Yeah, Nico's got a, like it's his frame. He's got like a really broad shoulders, long arms. It's just his striking's proper awkward, isn't it? It's it's not like a traditional style so Randy Brown he, he trains with Andre Harrison if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct same gym as uh, Andre uh, so he's got you know one of the one of the best 45ers in the world uh, training with him I know it's different weight classes but it's still skill set doesn't change on weight class you know if you're a great striker at 145 or a great wrestler at 145 it still transfers through the weight classes um, so when it comes to the grapplers like Randy's not uh, Andre Harrison by any means like Randy's the opposite. He's a striker. He likes to strike. He likes to. He wants to stand up and strike. Um, oh, your camera's gonna get. Here we go. Yeah, we can thank Skype for this, ladies and gents. Uh, Randy Brown. Yeah, I think that he's got weapons, but I don't think he's got enough weapons. I see moments in there where he's good and fights, like you say, but I think he just isn't. I think Nico Price is just like slightly above him. Just there's not a lot in them. But Nico's got a little bit like Nico's wild. Like he'll throw wild. He, he he. If you were a good counter striker, if you're good at going on the back foot with counter striker, I'm not saying Stephen Thompson, but he's a good example to use where he can measure fighters, step back like Leota, and get that counter striking. If Randy is patient and counter strikes Nico, he could put his lights out because Nico, when he strikes, does put himself out there in danger because he leaves himself exposed. But I don't think he will. Um, so I'm going to pick Nico here um, I think Nico will stop him on the feet but I think Nico later on he's going to fight guys that's just going to counter him man he is there to be dropped I, he's put he puts himself out there with some of them strikes uh, he needs to tidy that up a lot if he, if he wants to get a bit further but I'm going to go second round I'll go second round for Nico I'll let I'll let him Randy first I think he can make it through the first but second round Nico finishes him with strikes cool well, the weight division, Super Sage Northcutt moves back up from 155. I don't understand why he goes between divisions like every fight. It makes no sense to me that he wins, he wins a fight, wins a fight. Let's get that out there. Um, and then goes moves up a division again. Whether it's just the UFC handpicking matchups they think he can win to build a momentum or a confidence or stardom, whatever you want to say. He faces off against Zach Otto here. Um, yeah, go ahead. What are you seeing? You said the right thing there. Pick fights that are more suitable for him. I think Zach is a beatable guy for full Red Sage. He is an ideal fighter for Sage to fight. Um, I, I, I'm with you. I don't agree with him going up and down weight classes because 
what that doesn't do it doesn't give him consistency in a weight class and then that way he's, he's not really building any momentum because if I fight 155 then 170 my momentum's gone from the division before you know I, I need to stay in one weight class to build my run I need to get like four or five win streak in 170 155 whichever to build it and um, I don't know if that's maybe why they're switching the weight classes so that he doesn't have to go up the weight class rankings if that makes sense mm. so it could be a way that they're doing it so they're, they're trying to stop him going up so fast if they switch between weight classes he kind of can hover around a bit the lower echelon so they can give him more suitable fights again I, I don't think there's much stardom in Sage Northcott I really don't I think that train passed a while ago I don't feel it I don't see it I don't social media you don't see it as much these days it, it's kind of gone and I think that's good for Sage I think that weight is off his shoulders now big time you know I, I think we can actually get to see Sage relax a lot more be himself a bit more and also grows a bit more as a fighter rather than this ridiculous hype train that came out on him when he first came out like everyone thought he was a knee, bee's knees because he spun around and hit people and I was like yeah but who, who did he fight when he came to the UFC bunch of bums is what they gave him the big well I say bums the easiest guys they could give him and, and I think Zach is, a, is an easier option out of everyone to give uh, to give uh, Sage so I'm going to go with Sage North I think he's going to stop Zach I think he puts him away uh, I think Zach's just not quick enough. I think he's hittable. Uh, and he's not that big as a welterweight Zach Otto either. So, again, I don't think he'll overpower Sage. So, I'm going to go with Sage via stoppage first, second round, I'm going to go with. Mm. When you look at Sage Northcott's record, it really, I mean, he's wins in the UFC are Francesco Trevino, Cody Fester, Enrique Marine, Michelle Quinones, Tebow Guti. And he lost that fight against Tebow Guti. I don't think it was... For fun. Yeah, I, and in that Enrique Marine fight, he was very close to getting submitted as well. Yeah. Um, when he faces anybody that's tough, gritty, decent, Barbarina, it's just, he's tough. I think Mickey Gall has actually got some potential to move mm -hmm. forward. Not that we see him that all, all too much, which is a little bit weird. Um, they, push, they promote a bit though, Mickey. They, do, they get him in the yeah. UFC kind of bandwagon promotion stuff they send them around doing loads of things don't they so yeah they, they, they're probably they've got a bit of backing for mickey but you like you say yeah. he's not fighting enough in my opinion mm. I like, I, like i said i do love the fact that he's at team alpha male because yeah. i i think it is one of the base camps we have out there especially uh, with the guys that he's working with and you're having people like fabe on his corner and um so on zach was coming off that knockout went over mike pile Mike Pyle can't take a shot. No. Sage Northcott got hurt by T-Bolt Goatee last time as well, and I think he got, maybe got dropped in that one. He got, yeah, he got hurt a couple of times. It wasn't just one time, he got cracked. Yeah, yeah and uh, so it's hard to really trust Sage here, but when you look at the matchup, I think he's got the, the quicker hand speed. He has that over a lot of guys. Mm. I, think in, I think he's got uh, so much speed um, in a tight range against Zach Otto here that Zach Otto's not going to be able to see the shot coming. And like you, I think he catches him with a shot and puts him down. It'd be interesting to see if this goes to ground because I think Otto can maybe uh, sort of let him down in there. But I th like I say, I think it's another matchup the UFC want him to win this fight here. I think he's got a definitive speed and uh, striking advantage and I think he uses that. And eventually he catches Zach Otto with a shot and uh, will put him down for the win here. So Sage Northcott, I'm going to go second round, TKO victory there. Co-main event of the night, and it's a weird co-main event if you ask me. Yeah. Dennis the Menace Bermudez against Rick Glenn. Uh, and, yeah, I'm just... Uh, They're both coming off losses, well, aren't they? Well, uh, I think it's three in a row for Dennis. But... Yeah, Bermudez is coming off, and as as is Rick Glenn, but uh, just a weird co-main event, considering yeah. they've got people that could probably move into, into that kind of spot here. But to be saying that, it was supposed to be James Vick and Paul Felder, so... Mm. Um, it's hard to really as I'm saying you should maybe have a stronger third fight to move up there just in case that happens like we had with Ingano and Lewis but that turned out to be oh, horrific so um, yeah interesting here because I think Bermudez is always there to get put down because all it takes is one fairly decent shot and he will go down he's been down so many times the thing with this fight here, if he can establish takedowns on Rick Glenn, who's going to be a longer ranger guy who can take a beating and, and give a beating as well, 
I think the big thing in this matchup is I think that Mabrinez is going to go a straight wrestler here because his job will be in the line. If he loses four here in that featherweight division, I don't think they keep him around it here. They'll move him out. Uh, so he, I think he goes full wrestling mode here and will will look for many takedowns. Whether he keeps Glenn there, it's another thing altogether. Um, but I feel fairly confident in picking Dennis Ramirez here. Well, I shouldn't say fairly confident because Rick Glenn can crack and when he's on, he's a really good fighter to watch. Uh, I just think Bermudez is going to get takedowns here, and I think he's going to win um, through those takedowns. And I don't know whether he'll stop him. I don't know whether it'll be a decision, but I, I do see Dennis Bermudez winning this fight here. I I want to agree 100% with you. I do. I see three rounds, wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. Your job's on the line. Why risk it? Why put your face out there to get put to sleep? Keep it simple. I think, like, if you've got a strength that you know you've got, and Dennis always had a good wrestling, that's the thing. Dennis always had it. He just got a bit better of the striking. How much, like, Johnny Hendricks, the, probably the best example you can think of, got his title shot because he started using his hands. But then when he got the title shot, I was like, dude, one thing you're good at is wrestling. Like, why not just keep your title by doing the thing that you're really good at? You don't need to knock dudes out now. George St. Pierre didn't have to do it all the time. He got some decision wins, and I got they kept them his belt. So I think Dennis Bermudez, yeah, avoid. Uh, problem is Rick Glenn's been, isn't he team team alpha male as well? Yes. Good now, camp. Good camp. And what yeah. team alpha male do? They practice a lot of guillotines. Those do like their guillotines. I'm I am very tentative about Dennis Bermudez for the decision because I think Rick Glenn will be whapping on a guillotine here and then. Do you know what I'm saying? I I, I can't see him giving up the takedown without putting a threat in the in the in the mix whether it be throwing a knee or going probably more likely going for the guillotine if he's been with team alpha male enough um but i i i just think bermudez can stifle him a bit more and get him down and keep get and it's three rounds that's the key the fact that it's three rounds suits bermudez he can get three rounds in like that you couldn't do that for five i think he would say and i think rick could start picking him apart in the third to fourth fifth round because it's only three rounds I'm just, just going to pick Bermudez. Just. Yeah. So moving on to our main event of the night, we have the returning um, junior Cigano de Santos, which it actually turns out USADA, uh, he didn't pop for no. bad substances. That, see, that would, see, if I was a fighter, that would seriously fuck me off that they've, they've taken time away from my career. But in saying that, it might turn out to be a good thing. Um... I've always been a fan of the Santos, and he faces off against a new, a new uh, fighter to the UFC here. A guy that, if you if you watch the sport, and a, a hardcore fan, and you watch promotions outside the UFC, you will know who Blagoy uh, Ivanov is here. Um, interesting, it's interesting to see who they gave him first of all in the Santos. There, and uh, how do you see the fight going? Well, Dobrodin Ivanov, I'll speak Bulgarian to the man. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a big fight for your first fight as a heavyweight to come along rocking, you know. But then again, if you look at his record, folks, he did beat, I'm not saying these are great names, but Josh Copeland and Sean Jordan, who were your kind of guys in the top 15 rankings of the UFC, kind of, they were kind of like hovering around. So in a way, he kind of beat those guys and his next step up is someone like Junior Santos. Do you know, it's, in a way, he's kind of... He has done it right, if you look at it from that perspective. It's a bit warped, but it's the best I can do. Um, but, man, it's a it's a good fight. Because I... The one thing that bugs me about Junior Santos is... What JDS are we going to get? Right. If we get the patient JDS that beat Ben Rothwell... Who I did not see that coming. Like, I thought... I thought, Big Ben's going to hit him once and put him to sleep. But Junior Santos was beautiful. He was he was a craftsman in that fight. He used what he's got as that boxing, just beautiful long strikes, picked them away, kept them at kept them at distance. He looked fantastic in that fight. I want that JDS back. Beautiful it was. Against Ivanov, who is a striker, powerful dude. He will he's, I don't think he's nowhere near the polished striker as Junior Santos is. Nowhere near. And um, he can take a hit though. The dude's tough, um, but his conditioning is one thing that gets me. I know they're heavyweights and all this, 
but he's not got great conditioning. Like he's went three rounds before, and when you say slow down, he slows down. Now, Junior De Santos, if he's doing what he did, uh, like I say previously, beautiful strikes, lovely jabs to the stomach, you know, just taking the gas tank out. You know, he's got, he was using great footwork, getting in, getting out of the range. I'm going to pick Junior Santos on the on the basis, on the hope that he does turn up like that. Because if he does that, he's got this in the bag. He'll pick Ivanov apart, like pulled pork, absolute field day he'll have with him. And I think he'll, um, I think he'll stop him in probably like say the third round, even the se late second, third round. If he just picks his shots, because what happens is Ivanov will get frustrated. He'll start to come at him a bit overly aggressive. And Junior Santos, we know he's got great power. We know he's got great boxing. And that time off, hopefully, it's helped this chinny chin chin of his give him a bit more time to recover. Not ideal for him at his age and his, in his career, but for heavyweights, you can kind of get away with it. So going Junior De Santos, late second, third round finish. Yeah, like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of De Santos. I have been for a long time. Uh, and when he wins fights, he dictates He dictates very early. If he can get a striking form going, um, like he did in the role. Oh, well, you're breaking up there. You completely stopped and froze there, bro. So you said if Junior yeah. Santos can yeah. get dictate a pace yeah. and get going, go from there, bro. Yeah, if he can dictate and have a heavy workload like he can do, if he sits back like he did in the Overeem fight, that's when he gets caught and that's when he he, he can be put down. You know, he backs against the fence. If he backs against the fence here, and even though if he's going to run straight for him because he's got that Sambo background where. Uh, he will. He's going to want to try and take this fight to the ground. And I don't think there's any doubt about what he wants to do. When you, if you keep these two in the feet, there's a clear winner in that, in that aspect. And it's Junior De Santos. But a heavy strikes per minute um, workload from De Santos, I think, will throw even off completely off his game. He'll not know what to do um, when he has that heavy workload with his with his striking. He's very very accurate with it as well, and he pops you. Now saying that he is susceptible to taking shots as well and he has taken a lot of damage in his fights over his career the Miosic fight the Velasquez fights have taken so much out of him um, and especially coming off that it was a brutal knockout when he lost to Miosic last time out uh, but if he can open up with with really good strikes I think mesmerise him with his hands I think he can bring one of those leg kicks up top a uh, high kicks I should say and, and potentially catch him with another one of those um, I'm seeing, I know that some people I've spoken to very, very briefly that are quite confident in Ivanov and I'm like, he's going to be, I think he is the better underdog, it's the only fight that has, um, that has odds, I, I've never, I don't think I've had a look at them, but uh, he is the better underdog, uh, so I've been told. I like the Santos to come in here, heavy workload, picky strikes, be pinpoint accurate with them and just beat up. Uh, even off from the outside, and if he does that, I think that even is going to get. He's going to have to try and push for um, to do something in this fight, and he's going to catch a big shot, and he's going to be put down. So I'm hoping that Junior Santos can do that. I'm hoping he can come back and win, and I'm hoping he can he can start to because like the, the division's wide open again. So you've got a new champ at the top. People are going to be um, marching marching forward and looking to get that title shot with DC after the the Lesnar fight. So. Uh, I'm going to go Junior De Santos, a fourth round TKO victory there. So that is UFC Boise out the road. I'll quickly talk about bets. I haven't even made any bets and there's not very many odds. If the odds are fairly decent when they open over here for De Santos, it's something I might look at. But I need to be a little bit more selective because I got absolutely bum raped by, uh, last Friday and Saturday and I made a couple of silly bets, which uh, big bets as well for me that... that kind of shot on me so um, I need to, to be a bit more selective I don't think it's a card it's a close fight these these fight cards are always close fights and I'm a little bit wary um, so you've got to pick your spots it might be one of those parlay type cards I think mm. with it with the odd single fights in there um, I've got but like, say, June de Santos mm. four, four to seven All right, and okay. even off is five to four five 
minus four, so he's minus one twenty-five. Uh, I like De Santos. I think I, if that line might waver a little bit, it might go up, it mm. might go down. If it comes down, I'd like that a little bit more. I got Sage Northcott and Zach Otto are odds. Random, but okay. Oh, really? uh, Sage Northcott is eight to thirteen, mm. and Zach Otto is six to five. All right, so Sage Northcott's the minus one sixty dog, I think, uh, uh, favourite, I should say. So uh, that's, the only odds, that's the only odds I can see there. Sorry. Yeah, I think um, I think Kat Zingano is actually it might be at a decent. I don't know what the odds are going to be, obviously, because there's none released. But um, I wouldn't bet against Darren Elkins, even though I like mm. uh, Volkanovski. Uh, I don't know. It's, I think it's a tough, tough card to bet on, honestly. So I, I'll, I don't think I'll be playing all too much on that card there. So I think we're on to that. Uh, we're on to the questions now, which you will probably have up because I never do because I'm shit yeah. stuff like that. So <laughs> uh, uh, we do have yeah. questions this week, folks. Uh, so thank you for them. All right. So first questions we have are from our boy Matthew Hawkins. His Twitter handle is at coot c o o t six six hawk okay so theatrics aside how does brock fight how does the brock fight benefit the sport that's the first question he's asking well i don't think it benefits it in a from a from a sporting aspect and what i mean by that is from a for when i think about fights like great fights steep adc great fight you know mm. but when i think brock dc i think it's a eyes on a sport fight you're getting people from outside to, you're getting potentially new faces on a sport so they'll want to see brock fight okay cool they're gonna buy the pay-per-view they're gonna see other guys on that pay-per-view card so they they might get engaged in a sport they might follow the sport in future for the ufc that's what they see it as they see it as potential a they're gonna buy one pay-per-view so that guarantees them 60 dollars minimum i don't know what it is these days but then in the future they might get more because they might get new fans even if they only get see one percent of those fans that's 60 extra dollars every time that's a that's a lot of money for them overall so that's why that's what i feel that is the benefit to the not sport more the ufc what about yourself well how do you see this like how does the sport how does the brock fight benefit the sport i don't think it benefits the sport i think it just benefits the ufc mm. because the ufc are going to get that money and mm -hmm. you can say what you want about brock lesnar but when he was in his pomp in his early ufc days it was actually a pretty amazing time to be around that yeah uh, oh, oh around. my gosh brock lesnar is just a he's what I like about Brock Lesnar is he's, he's honest. Um, he's all about money. He hates people. Yes. He fucking hates people. It's <laughs> interesting to watch him speak. Uh, I've seen him on some podcasts. And like last night he said to Joe Rogan he would love to go on his podcast. I would love to hear that for like an yeah. hour, hour and a half. He's, he's just a totally different guy. And he's fascinating. And he brings eyeballs with him wherever he goes. Um I don't think he, he does a single thing that DC hasn't seen before. He is an absolute brute of a guy. Um, but I think how it benefits the UFC is it just gets... UFC needs stars to bring pay-per-views in. The, the pay-per-views this year, I guarantee, have been absolute... Especially with like um, Khabib falling out, the Khabib fight falling mm -hmm. out in April. And, uh, Ortega all, at Holloway this week. You know, that, will, that will 100% affect yeah, that pay-per-view people, people will be asking for refunds off of that. So yeah. um, it brings in eyes, it brings in money for the UFC and that's how it benefits them. It doesn't really benefit the sport because he's taken away rightful opportunities and guys like Volkov and Curtis Blades who have worked their way up into that position to get a title shot. Yeah. The UFC just went get to the side boys, Brock's coming in here, we're going to probably give him like $3 million to fight, um, where they guys are making 50000 if they're lucky, I reckon. Mm -hmm. So that's where, that, that kind of pisses me off a little bit, but I can see why they do it, because he brings in a lot of people uh, across the WWE thing as well, So and what he did last night, like we say, what he did last night was uh, priceless, uh, he was spot on with it, but that's how it benefits them, doesn't it benefit the sport, in my opinion, just benefits the UFC. Uh, his other question, relating to what you just said there, take all theatrics in account now. How pathetic was that? We spoke about this off-air, Will. We both are in agreement. 
I, I wouldn't use the word pathetic. I would use the word effective. Yeah. Because how many people talked about it online, on social media, it's and crazy. Facebook, everything, yeah. not just social, uh, insta every social media aspect, everyone had a comment. Now, yeah, albeit majority of them were negative, but how much do you want to bet, Will, that every one of those people that said that are going to watch the fight? Yeah. I, I, w every one of them people will watch that fight. So mm. as much as they want to do this, they're all going to be tuning in for that fight. Yeah. I had people message me today that never messaged me saying, is that true that Brock Lesnar's back? And I'm like, yeah, he's coming back. And uh, people, when when you have people like that, it's, it's the same with the Conor McGregor thing. If there's yes. ever a fight with him, my phone and inbox is absolutely go nuts from people who are just there, obviously, because he's coming back or he's fighting or whatever. It blows up and it's just the same with Brock Lesnar. Nowhere near it as much as what Conor McGregor is. Mm. But it's he garners interest. Um, and the most ridiculous thing about that last night, the promo was absolutely shit hot. You cannot take away from that. If you, if you think that's... Now, it might be a little bit corny because it, it, to me it did look staged because DC was like, come in the octagon, da-da-da-da-da. And the push was... If, if Brock Benson was going to push you, I guarantee that DC would be backing up further than what he did. Mm. Um, but the, the most ridiculous thing was what Brock Lesnar was wearing. Because he was in Vegas with his, his big t-shirt on, a jacket, a suit jacket. He had f fucking cowboy boots on, tucked in his, and his trousers tucked in his cowboy boots. I'm like, but nobody's going to say shit to that guy because he'll just fucking, <laughs> he'll just toss you to the side. Um, I think it's fun that he's back. I, I, I'm a little bit annoyed that he's taking a spot away from Volkov and Blades, who probably will end up fighting each other, I reckon. That's what I just said, mate. I, I, um, said, I said them two are going to fight each other. It's, I think it makes sense to put them together um, again. And uh, the one thing I've been wanting to think about with this is what, where does this put Cain Velasquez? Well, because... I, I, wait, mate, mate, I wouldn't even put Cain Velasquez anywhere near a title fight. Yeah. That dude has been out too long, inconsistent. I think he has to have at least three, three wins, at least three wins to get a title fight. No chance does he just walk in there. I'm not nothing against Cain Velasquez, but he's been out way too long. It doesn't bring the, what Brock brings. I know I'm just Brock's getting a title shot right now. It's ridiculous, but Cain Velasquez doesn't have that that star power effect. And how do we know if Cain's going to be able to make it to the fight? How do we know if Cain's going to make it after the fight? You know, he's so unreliable now. I wouldn't even think about it. I'd say, look, give Cain Velasquez someone, you know, who's someone else like no one like not Curtis Blades not Volkov well, not Volkov neither of them I think he should fight someone else outside of it I don't know who off the top of my head but he should definitely fight someone else outside there mm. next question buddy here we go uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do yeah so being Brock under the contract for both companies how much does one affect the other uh, again uh, it doesn't affect either party so to speak it's, it's a mutual agreement they've done it in the past they'll do it in the future if, if it benefits both it benefits both parties either way so there isn't, a, there isn't any kind of conflict there. Hence why he's doing it. If there was a conflict, he wouldn't be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thoughts on Joe Rogan's reaction to the mic being thrown? Um, well, if a gorilla grabs your hand and throws your mic, the reaction is, okay, do what you want. I won't resist. Because you're not going to have a choice. I don't. I think when he did, when he brought, grabbed it, I think Joe went, let go of my hand, please. You can have it. You can eat the microphone. You can keep it. You can do whatever you want with it. I don't. I don't want to hold this. And I, I, I don't think Joe Rogan give a crap either. I think he was just too much. Like, this is awesome. Yeah, you can see by his face. Like, look at. Yeah. I I've watched that a couple of times this morning. I went back and rewound it, and it's just you look at Joe Rogan's face, and he's like, oh, this is brilliant. He loves stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, next question we have uh, again from Matt. We have, he, he texts twice in. Nganu and Lewis was a, a disaster. Let's put it lightly there, mate. Uh, Lewis mentioned in the post presser that he knew it was embarrassing. Dana followed up and said it didn't hurt his position. Uh, who is his best fit for his next fight? So he's, I don't think it hurt his stock at all, Derek Lewis. Says. I think, yeah. to be fair, do you know what the biggest thing that I think helped him was like you saw him with his back like grabbing his back remember yeah. when uh, when Herb Dean stopped them between rounds and grabbed his back 
Like, if I'm a fighter and I see a dude do that, I'm thinking, I want to wrestle you. Because mm. if I get you on your back, you're not getting me off you. But Ngannou just went, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing, which is fuck all, and just stay away from it. Like, just take the, the go for a takedown. Like, at least try, hurt the guy's back. It's hot. Like, it just blew my mind that. Anyway, uh, opponent will, a potential opponent for Mr. Derek Lewis. Uh, who would you pot- potentially put down there for him? I have two guys off kind of top of my head. One, I think, is more realistic than the other. I think that if Junior De Santos were to win this week, I think, this upcoming week, I should say, mm. I think it makes sense to put them together. I think they're going to be quite close in the rankings. Yeah. Um, you look at Derek Lewis's face, people like Mark Hunt, um, and he's... Uh, it makes sense to maybe make that fight, new fresh fight. Another one I was thinking was Tai Tuivasa, which I'm not sure is too much of a a push quick, but I'm thinking of that new uh, Australia card at December. That's like maybe five months away. Usually they put Derek Lewis away in different parts of the world, so it might make a fight with Tai Tuivasa. I think the, the fight to make if GDS wins, you put him against Junior De Santos person. I think that's the one to make. I would agree as well. Uh, Matt thoughts were my vote is Curtis Blades. We said before we think that should be Kurt Blades versus Volkov, and then then you establish your your effective number one contender with that fight. Yeah. And I think that's a good one because I think if either party lose lose to each other, it it's not a bad thing because I could see both of them working their way back again to a title yeah. shot, uh, title contention future. Uh, long shot, he said, tied to Ivasa. I'm just a fan and eager. Uh, next question we had was, let me find it, sorry, give me a second, let me scroll through here, it was, here we go, uh, our boy Greg, alright, uh, Twitter handle is UK1 Man Wolfpack, uh, his is, after the methodical destruction of Tavares, who's next for the style bender, so hyped for this guy, Adesanya, mm. man, like, he said he wanted Costa, he said, that's what Adesanya said he wanted, yeah. He said he'd like that fight. I, I I don't know if the UFC will put those two prospects against each other myself. I think you'd want to keep them separate because at least you keep two protect because at least if you do match them up separately and they both win, you've got two guys still going up in the rankings. But then yeah. if and then if one of them lose, one of them lose. But if you put them against each other, you're gonna guarantee one of them's gonna fall. Rather than letting them go on their own accord, because you definitely want a couple of new fresh faces in that middleweight top contention. Yeah. So will who would you like to see Mr. Stylebender potentially fight? I know you're thinking Elias Fiodoro before you say it, but who, who are you thinking? <laughs> I was I was thinking, I was just looking at the rankings right here, and it's just, you have to, well, he's beat Brad Tavares. He wasn't a ranked fighter before, so he has to move into that top 10. He really has to, he has to move in front of Brad Tavares. So Uriah Hall is not going to be fighting him. No. Yeah, Paolo Costa, he could fight him, but I, Dana did say last night, they're going to be going a different way because he sees them. Adesanya wants Costa, and he's like, "Well, we're probably going to go a different way there." Yeah. Realistically, that fight's not going to put together. Um, Theodoro is one that they could make. I don't think they will make it. If I had to pick one out, it looks like Branch is fighting Jackery, and you look yeah. at the rest of it. I think you go look Rockhold. I think that's the fight, and it's a big, that's a mm. freaking massive jump from Tavares to a former champion. But he might be catching Luke Rockhold at the perfect, perfect time. Um, if he can keep it standing, I think absolutely he can hurt Luke Rockhold on the feet. And that's a big, I don't know if you make it a, a main event, you could make it a co main oh, event. You'd have, to, you'd have to make it, you'd have to make it a main event. Because you want those five rounds, don't you? You want to yeah. get those five rounds. I know you just had it, but you want to give them a five rounder. Yeah. Because that, that's uh, that's the way of solidifying your title contention. You give them a yeah. five round fight, don't you? I think those two new guys we're talking about in Costa and uh, Adesanya into the, the the rankings to say one one should fight Weidman, which Costa was calling for last night. Another one should yeah. fight Rockhold. The rest of the guys are matched up. I, th- I thought Derek Brunson, because I heard that his matchup was pulled. But I think Yes, he got pick- injured. Brunson got injured, yeah. Yeah, but I think they've put that fight back together a month later, actually. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, as I say, Antonio Carlos Jr., yeah, he's a, yeah. He's a guy who's he's, he's going to go under that radar, Carlos Jr. Dude is a monster. 
of middleweight <laughs> as well. So he's going on that radar. He's one that's sneaking along. He's not as loud as like your Costa and your and your Adesanya, but he's sneaking yeah. up those rankings too. I, I thought when Greg's a kickboxing guy as well, he's been to many events and he's a kickboxing guy. So I thought we might get a question, something like that. He's a big, obviously, fan of Adesanya. Um, yeah. And I thought that Tavares would give him problems. He Tavares had nothing for Adesanya. So this guy is really making jumps very quickly. And in between fights, he's doing that. He's a, he's a, a guy you have to keep your eye on. I mm. think he could give, I honestly think he could give Luke Rockhold serious, serious problems this early on in his UFC. Yeah. So um, that's the that's the way I've got. I've got Costa, Weidman, Adesanya, Rockhold. I don't know about you. I think. I, I, I'm the same. I think Rockhold and Weidman throw them, throw them into Costa and Adesanya. Why not? What, what? Yeah. Everyone else is booked up. Why not? You know, if they're free, put them in there. You know, mm. you got like you say, Rob Whitaker and Kelvin Gastelum are fine out. No, well then there you go. What you're gonna do? Sit there and wait. Mm. You, you can't because that means you're gonna be out of action for nine, twelve, nine, ten months because they've got to do the filming, then they've got to release the show, and then the fight event happens. So you're looking at maybe. You know, and then someone say four. Then you've got to wait till the winners, if, what if the winners aren't healthy, etc. Because um, this gives time for Rob Whitaker to recover as well. Uh, so, yeah, you've got just get it, get those fights in December time, and I think that's ideal. You know, get them in before the end of the year. Get those two guys. Why not? What's what if they lose and it's Sanya again and Costa lose? There's no harm. They're young. They're coming through the ranks. They're growing. It's not a problem. Luke Rockhold, Weidman, they're in their mid, the early 30s they're starting to get to that point where there's no there's no harm in it uh, next up we have da, 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 let me go through here folks okay so <clears throat> and this is from Farrell Connolly the selfie king uh, so his twitter handle is at Farrell Connolly now here we go so heard Chiesa say during the weigh-ins his last fight at 155 because he missed weight uh, and he looked like a skeleton as always uh, do you think uh, do you guys think uh, 170 is a smarter option for him and how does he, how does he fare in a 170 division if so look they need more divisions I'm not going to bore anyone with that story again the UFC are just too stuck in their ways of not bothering to add more divisions they could easily do it they're just being fucking lazy if brutally honest um, but 170 I think Casey could be alright there I think he'd be healthier like look at that Pets fight he he clearly he's fought better than that in the past. You should you can see how much that weight cut messed him up. He didn't look in good shape. But look at the guys who have went up to 170 and done well. Tosanos, Masvidal, Cerrone. You know, the guys just the guys that are going back up to 170, Felder, to be brutally honest. But but Felder didn't break his arm in the first round. I'm telling you, he would have stopped Mike Perry. Because he was doing he was doing fine. Like that arm break early in that two two minutes into the second, first round. I'm telling you, he would have got a lot better out of it. So, I think Kays will be okay. He's a big, long guy at 170 as well still. He's not a short dude. I think he'll be all right myself. How do you see him at 170? Uh, I'm see, like, he, I thought he was an absolute bail end last week. Uh, during the whole entire fight week, I thought he was overacting. He was seeing, uh, he was taking the piss like, out of... Um, Pets, yeah. It's when he missed missed weight, um, so he should know how hard it is to, to like to make that weight. Like you said, they need to make it one sixty five. To me, is an absolute no brainer division. Just change you, the weight classes: one six five, one seven five, one eight five. Go up in tens, easy. Done. Look at the, like people like Kevin Lee uh, and Kaza would move into that one sixty five. Michael um, James Vick would move up into mm. there, and it's healthier. These guys don't have to kill themselves. To make that weight, it makes you'll get sure you'll get better fights. You'll get yeah. better fights as well. That's it the key. And yeah, um, and like we've seen, there's a precedent. If you move up in weight, you usually end up fighting a lot better than what you mm -hmm. what you ever have. The proof's in the pudding. You've seen it with Dan Hooker. Yes. Yeah. With Rob Whitaker. You've seen it with uh, like the, the people you mentioned. Kelvin Gaslam as well. Yeah, you know, he's, yeah, he's got he, a title shot one eighty five. So it makes. I think he'll do okay. I think he'll be a ranked fighter. I can see him being in that. 10 to 15 kind of type position and there's fights in there you could put him with um, like a, a Gunnar Nilsson I think would be a pretty fun fight him against Gunnar uh, would be a good fight um, but I don't see him being any better than maybe a top 15 guy mm. but I think it's going to be a lot better for his health and him moving forward I don't know 
how long he's going to be in the game, Michael Keyes. I think he, he, he might bounce fairly, fairly soon and maybe go into the TV side of things if they have him in there. Who knows? But um, I think that the move move up is be, uh, the best thing for him, personally. And last question, again from Farrell, is after Dan Hooker's impressive finish of Gilbert Burns, who would you like to see him face next? I think someone like Pettis wouldn't be a bad shout. Again, let's be honest, 155 is ridiculously packed. There is a plethora of guys that he could fight. Now, we both thought Pettis probably no. I'm just going to throw this name out there. I think this would be an absolute bomb burner of fight. I think this guy needs to get fighting anyway. Tyson off. I don't know what's going on with Tyson off. I, I, I know, but I want. I'm just putting that name there because I'm, I'm missing. I'm missing. I really, like he's he can't. He's, he's pulling out a grappling fight as well. He was supposed to face Diego Sanchez in a grappling fight. Mm. Um, come Morris. on. Now, yeah, Morris, yeah. Uh, no, I think it was the ACB yeah. Jiu Jitsu oh, or something, right. something like that. I don't know. Um, and he pulled out of that one. That uh, Tysonov is fastly becoming. He's not like the forgotten man. People know who he is, but because he don't fight, you totally forget all about him. Um, I think. I think you could give him a ranked opponent, maybe like a Trinaldo or something like that. I don't think. I think Pettis is going to be looking forward, but when you look at the people who's going to be in front of Pettis, it's people that he's lost to majority of the time. Barboza, um, Pori, Alvarez. Uh, maybe you meet Tony Ferguson against Anthony Pettis um, as a main event. If who knows what's going on with the Conor Khabib situation, I don't know. Um, Dan Hooker, I think maybe someone like a Gregor Gillespie. Mm. I think you could put him in. But then again, you're you're kind of stopping two guys potentially moving at that top fifteen, and it needs new blood. People yeah. like Ronaldo um, needs to kind of come out of there. Personally, I, I I don't know. I think you could give him a top fifteen guy. I think they'll give him one of these hard fights to see if he can get in there. But uh, I don't know. He he's looked great since he's moved up. He he looks a killer. Yeah. At that position, one, so. 145 killed him. He, uh, it yeah. was not the weight class for him, and he looks superb at 155. I agree. Yeah, yeah um, man, it is hard, isn't it? Because like Ally Quinta, maybe. Oh, yeah, they're fighting at New York in November, aren't they? So it makes sense. Yeah, Ally Quinta, Dan Hooker. I would go for that. That'd mm -hmm. be a good scrap. Yeah, it'd be a good one. Yeah, well, that's all the questions we've got. That's all the questions, folks. That's the okay. podcast, mate. There you go. So that's another one there. So uh, we are done for another week. We have another one next week, and it's actually in Germany. And oh, actually, yeah. I'm looking at the card right now, and it's actually a pretty. And it's on a Sunday, by the way. Yeah, uh, good fights. So, uh, I think it's got some really. I like the Corey Anderson's moved into Latifi's position. Yeah, he has. Um, Volkan's obviously got shifted to face Gus, so Anthony Smith mm. moved in to face Shogun, which I think should be a good fight. Danny Roberts against Alan Joban's a good fight. Mm -hmm. Dia Keyes against Hatpras a good fight. I actually think for a European card, it's actually pretty solid. Manny Bermuda has got rematch today got with Davy Grant, which we are mm. happy to hear about. Um, and it's just, I think it's a very solid, actually a really solid fight card. And in fact, it's on a Sunday. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. It'll be finished. In the kind of early evening, we'll probably, I don't know if there's a fight card after that that we'll be doing a podcast on. Um, which Gosh, yeah, we will, yeah. Will we do that? Yeah, Actually, there's one after. I think we might have a, do we have a week off? No, we don't. No, we no. don't. It's yeah. Alvarez versus Pori 2. Uh, Aldo versus Stevens and GJ versus Torres. Sick Hand card, sick. Mondays against Auburn Mercy. Um, so really good cards coming up. Um and really, I actually noticed that last night they released the schedule for the end of the year. I think the, the last 10 weeks of the year, uh, or the last 12 weeks, they have 10 events. So it's pretty much back to back to back. And they take two weeks off in December before the last pay-per-view of the year. So it's going to be a kind of hectic run towards the end of the year. Um, as always, thank you for your questions. Get them sent in any time through the week. We'll get them done for next day. Uh, we'll get them done next week. Again, if you can subscribe and get a, a account up, that would be absolutely great. Um, from John and myself, take care. We'll see you all soon, and uh, thanks for listening. Boom, 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 doom, boom. Nice one, bro. Yeah.